Thanks, Mark. Hey, welcome everybody. You're welcome to take a seat, kids. You are welcome to be dismissed. Your teachers are in the back. Um, before we get started, I, I just want to give a shout out. There's so many people that uh, serve and do so much to make this service happen. We have our worship team. We have our tech guys. We have our teachers in the back. Pastor Allen had knee surgery on Monday, and he's here working. So can we give everybody just a round of applause and thank you for what they do to serve us. It, it, it's honestly been such a blessing to see so many of you use your gifts and your talents uh, to serve the kingdom of God, to love the church. So thank you for being a part of it. Again, Skylar already said, but welcome if you're visiting with us. We're glad you're here. And I hope you all can join us after service. We're going to have a ton of food. It's going to be a great time. Again, if you didn't bring anything, that's okay. Feel free to eat. We've got a ton. And stay just to support our youth as they're competing for the best dessert. Uh, we need people with good taste buds who like sweets. So if any of you, if that's you, uh, stick around. It's going to be a good time. Uh, but before we look at God's Word, let me pray uh, this morning. So Father, we are so thankful for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, that you are a solid rock on which we could base our lives, on which we can find truth. Um, Lord, we just praise your name this morning. I ask that you'd speak to us as we all come from different walks of life. We have different issues and different things on our minds. Um, Lord, would we find hope in you this morning? I pray that you replace our fears with courage and faith and joy. Be with us. Be with the kids and kids ministry right now. That you just bless them and their teachers that they'd come to know you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 We're not going to look at it just yet, but go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel 14. That's where we're going to be predominantly this morning, 1 Samuel 14. But if you didn't notice, this last week was Halloween. Hopefully you noticed that. Um, but kind of the thing that goes hand in hand with Halloween is the word fear. Right? I mean, you have scary statues in front of people's houses. People walk around trying to look scary. Uh, if you have any like, like media platforms, there's all the lists of scary movies that come out. Um, you know, fear is an interesting thing. Um, even you know, when you're a kid, you think that you would grow out of all of your fears when you're an adult. But that doesn't necessarily happen, does it? Just uh, about two weeks ago, my wife and, and baby, they, they flew out to South Carolina to see her family. And, and in my mind, I'm like, okay, uh, you know, I'm bummed that they're leaving, but man, am I going to get good sleep. You, you know, a two and a half month old baby, like, I don't know if you know this, but babies cry. Uh, and so sometimes they cry in the middle of the night. We've tried to tell him, please don't cry, uh, but he just does it anyway. So I'm like, okay, I, I'm missing them, but I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to sleep so good. Uh, so, so they're gone. I get the house ready. Uh, I, I get into bed. You know, I, I'm just ready. Okay, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Um, but the problem was that there was no sound. Uh, and it's just dead silence, uh, so silent to where I hear little creaks in the house. You ever heard this? Uh, you hear little noises in the garage or in the attic or whatnot. And all of a sudden, in my mind, I'm like, did, did, did I lock all the doors? Is, is that somebody in the house here? Is it just the wind? And I'm like, okay, no, Abel, you're a full adult. Like, you don't need to get up and check. Just trust yourself that you locked the door. But then it's in my head, right? And I remember that documentary I watched about that guy that snuck into that house because somebody didn't lock their door. And so eventually I battle it out for 20 minutes until I'm so encompassed with fear that I have to get up and make sure I, lock, I did lock the doors, by the way. Um, but it's funny, we get older and we still have fear. Things still startle us. Just this morning, I walk into the church, it's still dark out. No Nobody's here before I turn on the lights, and as I'm walking in the sanctuary, one of the kids' toys in the cry room starts talking to me. And I about, you know, I was like, not today, Satan, you know, and I just, but we, as we get older, we still have fears. Um, and, and I feel like as we grow as a society, um, we're not necessarily getting better at this. I mean, I feel like in some ways more fears are introduced now than they were back when. I mean, back when we were younger, it felt like fears were pretty basic. You're afraid of needles. You're afraid of doctors, dentists, or babies, or whatever it is. You had your basic fears. But now it feels like every year there's things added on that we need to be afraid of. Over the last 10 years, a big thing is you need to be afraid of cleaners and chemicals, right? You're not a good parent if you still use cleaners. Clorox or bleach. you got to use the natural peppermint essential oil cleaner. Uh, you've seen this stuff? A and yes, it smells good. Supposedly it's better for you, but when you
you clean the sink, it, it, it doesn't seem like it cleans as good as a good douse of bleach, right? Where it stings your nostril. Like, it just doesn't do it. But we need to be afraid of this because it can cause harm. There's all these things, right, that we need to be afraid of. And those, those are basic things. But even on, on a more national scale, on a larger scale, a lot of people are living in fear, aren't they? I mean, there's a lot of things to be afraid of right now. I mean, look at with COVID, the health and disease scare. How many people were just panicked, were just terrified, right? That, that didn't know how to cope. And people still live in massive fear. How many people right now with the economic climate of our country are terrified? Where's this thing going? Where do I put my money? Do I keep it in the stock market where that can be volatile? Uh, do I put it in the housing market? Do I put it in gold or have just cash under my bed? But what about inflation? I mean, it's hard to know. And people are kind of just terrified of what's going to happen. People are scared of the government. Who's going to gain power? Who isn't going to have power? Um, with gun violence, right? I was watching a documentary on climate change uh, that we're at the brink of mass extinction. And a lot of people live in constant fear of at any day it's going to happen. The volcanoes, the ice is going to melt we're all going to die right the oceans are going to rise up california is going to drop into the water people are afraid of the border they're afraid of offending people or lawsuits businesses have to have a million signs out so they don't get sued i mean we're a nation where people um, are almost crippled with fear and I feel like the news kind of plays off of this because they know if we can get people afraid they'll listen more and we get higher ratings i mean it's a real thing isn't it and even if you're here this morning, you're like, well, you know, I'm not the fearful type, right? Like, I wouldn't get up out of bed. If I locked the door, I know I locked the door. Like, that's not me. I don't struggle with any of this. I'm not afraid of the government, the economy, whatever. I'm safe. But, you know, fear sometimes can be kind of secretive, kind of work under the radar. We don't even know it's there. We don't even know we have it. Let me give you a few examples. Um, do you feel anxious or worried ever? Stressed out? Tense about the future? Not know where it's going? See, a lot of those feelings, the deep root underneath is fear. Uh, maybe for you, do, do you get angry a lot? You're like, well, what does anger have to do with fear? Well, maybe you're angry a lot because you're afraid you're not um, getting the attention you deserve or the respect you deserve or, or, or being noticed as, or seen as much as you should. And so that fear comes out like, no, I have to be seen. And it comes out in anger. Maybe you are, have the fear of losing control. Maybe you have the fear of failure. You're always, you're a workaholic, you're working super hard, you're trying to be successful, hustling, doing your thing, uh, but really it, it's rooted in a sense of I can't fail and I'm afraid of that, so I have to work super hard to feel safe. Maybe you're afraid of being found out. Maybe there's something you've been hiding that no one else knows, and you're like, okay, I I'm afraid, will that come out one day? Maybe you're afraid of losing someone or something, losing your job, your loved one, your marriage, whatever it is. Maybe you're afraid of change, the unknown. I, I mean, we can keep going on and on. But you see, all of us, in some way, struggle with fear, don't we? We all do, whether you know it or not. But the Christian answer, here's the hard thing. A, a, a lot of pastors, a lot of Christians, when, when they hear someone say, I'm afraid, they slap them with this verse as a quick fix. Let me throw this verse up. 2 Timothy 1.7. This is kind of the cliche Christian. If someone's afraid, you give them this verse and they should be good. It says this, for God gave us a spirit, not of what? Fear, but of power and love and self-control. So we quote that to someone and say, so you good now? Uh, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, uh, so you shouldn't be afraid, so don't be afraid. We good? And I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes I don't feel like I have a spirit of courage. I feel like I have a spirit of fear. Don't you? And, and just if someone tells me, Abel, don't be afraid, that, that doesn't necessarily help. I don't think we can fix fear with that. I think we have to go deeper. We have to address some things. And what we're going to do is we're going to look in 1 Samuel, a man who was courageous when everyone else wasn't. And we're going to look at where did he find that courage? How was he able to conquer that fear? Before we read it, a little context. Um, Saul was the king of Israel. And he made a big mistake in the previous chapter. The Philistine nation had come up against Israel. There were thousands of them. They were armed. They were angry. They were bloodthirsty. They outnumbered the Israelites by a ton. Everyone in Israel was so afraid that they ran, they hid in caves. It said they hid in tombs, in wells, in cisterns, whatever they could. They were terrified. And here was King Saul, and all this fear rushed upon him, and he made a rash decision. And then God says to Saul, you're no longer going to be king. I'm not walking with you anymore. It was heavy. 
And so now the Philistines are camped all throughout Israel, ready to pounce, ready for battle. It's the calm before the storm, and everybody's frozen in fear of what do we do now? And that's where our story picks up in 1 Samuel 14, verse 1. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, so Saul being the king, this is his son, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron, and the people who were with him were about 600 men. Verse 4. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. So here's the moment. Stand still. What do we do? The Philistines are getting ready to attack. And Jonathan, being the king's son, people are going to him. They're like, Jonathan, what are we going to do? Where's your dad? Well, we're hearing stories that maybe God left him as king and that God's not on his side anymore, which means God's not on our side. Jonathan, what's going to happen? And Jonathan feels this pressure now of, i got to do something. Dad, what are we going to do? What's going on? And his dad's frozen. Everybody's frozen. Everybody's terrified. And Jonathan comes up with an idea. Verse 6. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. This is Jonathan's idea. So here they are. The, The Philistines are on this other side of this canyon. Right? It's a deep crevice in the earth, a canyon that's rocky and jagged on both sides. It's so big that the Philistine army's like, they can't get across it. So you got Israelites on one side, Philistines on the other, and Jonathan's like, okay, I got an idea. I'm going to get my armor bearer, a young guy. Basically, that's like a golfer saying, I'm going to get my caddy. Right? I'm going to get the, this, this guy. And him and I, we're going to go down the canyon, we're going to rock crawl down the canyon, and, and rock crawl up, and the two of us are going to fight the Philistines. What a plan. What a plan. You're talking thousands of Philistines. And he goes to his armor bearer and he's like, hey, you and I are going to do this. And you think his armor bearer would be like, you know, Jonathan, that, that's courageous. You, you're, you're really brave and i got to give you credit. But buddy, you're nuts. Okay, like, like there's thousands of them. There's two of us. I just carry the armor. I'm not a fighter here, okay? Like, what, what's going on? But Jonathan convinces his armor bearer and they both go. How did they have that courage? How did they, how were they not like everybody else, cowering in fear? What's the key to that? I mean, any one of us, I'm just going to go on a limb. I imagine none of us would think of that plan, and if we were offered that plan to be one of those two people, we wouldn't go. I wouldn't. I'd be like, you're nuts. So how do they have courage amidst fear? Let's look at verse 6 again. Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. What was Jonathan getting at? He was saying, look, the battle, the real battle, it doesn't matter how many thousands of them or there's just two of us, God is the one that wins battles. And we don't know the result. He says it may be. He's not like, this is guaranteed going to happen. But he's like, there's a chance. We're the people of God. They're not. And we have faith in him. So let's act in faith amidst our fear. Here's the first key to fighting fear. The first key to fighting fear is having faith. Here's how this works. Y'all remember Toys R Us? They all close down, right? Uh, But Toys R Us, if you were a kid, there was nothing better, right? Like for me, that beat Disneyland because they're actual toys that I could take home. I can't take home stuff from Disneyland and not get arrested. But so like for me, going to Toys R Us, it was the dream. And so I remember uh, before Christmas time, my parents would often take us to Toys R Us where we could kind of glance at, point at, and say, I want that. Uh, We were kind of phasing out of the Sears catalog where you used to circle the toy. They're phasing out of that. And they're like, so they take us all to Toys R Us. And now mind you, there's eight kids in my family, right? Uh, so it's massive. I'm about this big, and we're walking around like a parade in Toys R Us. And I'm a young kid in a toy store, right? I get distracted. Men are visual, and I'm just looking around like, this is paradise. There's Legos. There's guns. There's all this stuff. And pretty soon before I realize it, um, I wander off from my family. And, and I'm wandering around. I'm fine until all of a sudden a light bulb goes on. of like, wait a second. Uh, Abel, you're alone in a toy store. 
What just happened? Well, I'm thinking, like, is this like home alone? There's going to be the pigeon lady that's going to grab me. What's going to happen? I'm t- and all of this fear just overwhelms me of I'm going to die in a toy store, right? So what do I do? So I start running around frantically trying to find my parents until finally the, the announcer calls, is there an Abel Burke in the store? Come to the front. You know, I come to the front, and I see my parents. And the craziest thing, I had this huge fear, this huge stress. I'm sweating bullets. As soon as I see my parents, what happens? The fear subsides to nothing. I feel utterly safe because of their presence with me. And see, here's the thing with fear. All of us have found ways to cope with fear. So when we're afraid, we have found people or things or thoughts or whatever it be that we look to to calm us in moments of fear. It was the same with Jonathan and his armor bearer, except what they were looking to was the right person amidst fear. What does he say? There's this huge battle, and he says, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. See, the key to fear this morning is having faith in God. The key to fear is having faith in God. Psalm 23, 4. This is a famous passage. It says this, Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Some versions say, Even though I walk through the valley of death. I will fear no evil. Now that's not easy to do. All of us have been in dark moments. We've been afraid of death before. So this is terrifying moment, right? Okay, there's a fear. I should be afraid. It's a dark moment. But then what does he say next? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, David didn't, in the moment of fear, he was like, you know what? 2 Timothy says I shouldn't have a spirit of fear, so I'm just going to put my big boy pants on and I'm not going to be afraid. That's not what he says. He looks up and he says, God, you are with me. Isaiah 41.10, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In moments of fear, do you remember who your father is? Because I think it's so easy, myself included, that we can look to the wrong people or the wrong things. And sometimes it's not even rational, but we do it anyway. Let's go back to being a kid. You remember in your bedroom at night, afraid of, is there a monster in the closet? Is a T-Rex going to come through the window, swallow me, and take me out? Uh, You have those fears, right? Am I the only one? You watched Jurassic Park too young and that happened. Um, But, you know, you're sitting there with fear, and, and maybe you call out your parents, and they finally come in, and what happens? That fear subsides, but it's not even really rational, because if there's a monster in your closet or a T-Rex outside, are your parents going to be able to save you from that? Probably not. Probably not, but so often in our lives, we look to people that can't save us. We look to relationships. Oh, I finally found stability. They finally love me, but then they hurt us and leave or they pass away. We look to careers that can fall apart, jobs that are steady that become unsteady. We look to all of these things because sometimes it's hard to have faith in God amidst fear because we can't see God. Look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 5. So we are always of good courage. Verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. 1 Corinthians 16, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Now that's a good like men's conference verse right there. You know, let's be masculine, let's act like men, we're strong, we're not afraid. Um, But what's the key to that? What, what, What does it say the key to being strong and not fearful? Stand firm in the what? Faith. Let me give you an example of how this works. Remember Peter on the boat in the water? Disciples are on the boat in the water. They're already kind of afraid. The storm, the wind, and all that. They're like, we're going to die. It's kind of that valley of the shadow of death moment. Uh, then they see Jesus walking on water. And they're even more afraid of like, whoa, he's walking on water. That's scary, right? You know, there's no coral reefs in the Galilee. So like he's walking on water. And so they see him. And, and then Peter says, okay, Jesus, should I come out? What should I do? Now pick up this ver- in verse uh, Matthew 14, 29 says this, Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of what? Little faith. Why did you doubt? Jesus was saying, Peter, the key to your fear is faith. The key to your fear is faith. 
For so many of us this morning, if you struggle with fear, do you know who your Father is? Do you know who your God is? Jonathan knew. And in midst fear, he looked and had faith. Well, you ask, well, how do I grow my faith? Because faith isn't easy to have. Well, faith comes from knowing the truth. Look at this, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. Our first point this morning, um, you fight fear with faith and you find faith with truth. You fight fear with faith and you find faith with truth. Truth. Do you know the truth? And in moments of fear, in moments of anxiety, in moments of stress, you hold on to the Word of God that tells you who your Father is, that He sees you, that He knows you, that He's competent, that He's strong. You fight fear with faith. Okay, but that's not it. Because sometimes you can fight the battle in your mind, but you're still kind of frozen in the moment. How, what are kind of the three main ways that people respond to fear? Fight, flight, or what? Freeze. Fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and, and so here's Jonathan. He, he kind of has the mind game of like, okay, no, God's the one that saves, armor bearer, we're going to handle this. Um, but they still have to act. Look at verse 8 in 1 Samuel 14. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over the men, and we will show ourselves to them if they say to us, Wait until we come to you. Then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into your hand, and this shall be a sign to us. Now this is an interesting plan. He's like, all right, we're going to crawl down the massive canyon. We're going to do some rock climbing stuff, rappel down. Then we're going to get up almost to the top. And then instead of hiding and and having the surprise attack, we're going to show them we're here. And and if they say, come on up, then we're going to go up and fight them. That will mean God's with us. It's an interesting plan. But what's shocking is they actually do it. They actually do it. There's no chance of winning. There's no chance. I mean, they don't even know, is God going to come through? It says he may come through, but they step out in faith. I think that's an important thing that we so often miss. We want all our ducks in a row before we step out, don't we? In order for me to face my fear, I need to see the before and after plan. I need to see the whole spreadsheet. I need to know that I am perfectly safe in making this decision before I step out in faith. See, I think there's there's a problem in America right now. We're we're in a hard time. I mean, people are terrified. People, we went through all the things that people are afraid of right now. And and it's caused so many people to kind of be frozen in place. We have this phrase called safety first. And and, and who can argue? I mean, that's a good thing, right? It's good to be safe and all that. Safety first. Um, but, But I think the problem is we've exalted safety so much that we no longer take risks that we no longer step out in dangerous territory and do great things because we're too concerned with, I need to be comfortable, I need to be safe, I need to be relaxed and low stress, and everything has to be okay. And that's the biggest priority in my life, even for my kids, that we have to be safe. But here's here's why this is important. How was America founded? It was founded by people that said, safety is not first. Christopher Columbus, he wasn't the only guy on the boat, was he? There were multiple people that sailed the sea, right? Um, And when they did that, they knew that it was kind of a bleak, like numbers-wise, the chances of them surviving weren't great. But they saw something great ahead of them, and they chose to say, hey, we're going to put safety down here, second, third, fourth, fifth, wherever it is, and I'm going to step out in faith and do something great. When the early colonies decided to fight off the British, that wasn't a safe decision, was it? The safe thing would be to say, you know what, Um, okay, we don't like the Brits, maybe they they try to encroach on us, who we can worship, how we can act, but at, at war, that's dangerous, you know? I mean, that's not safe for me or my family, so let's just let them be. They didn't do that. They stood up, they put safety aside for the greater good. I mean, we go down the line, look at the heroes of America, Abraham Lincoln, stood up for the rights of slaves as president. Talk about something you could destroy your career with. You ever see that, that photo of Abraham Lincoln when he first was president? And that photo by the time he was done being president? I mean, that guy looked like he aged 150 years. Uh, I mean, the, the stress that went over him, the battle, the wars, and all of that, it wasn't a safe decision, but it was the right decision. He stepped out. Eventually, it cost him his life. He was assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr., right? You think it was safe to stand up for civil rights and justice uh, for slavery? I mean, not slavery, but racism? What happened? He was assassinated, but he stood up for what was right. Why are we talking about this? Because I think as Christians, 
We can be like everybody else, and we're so concerned. My comfort, my safety, my leisure, my bank account, that we forget to step out in faith to do great things for the kingdom of God. We forget to stand up for what's right. I want to pause from the story and talk about a few ways. I was praying this week, and some of the stuff we're going to talk about is a little hard, but it's hard for me too, that I think as Christians, we need to no longer be afraid of and pause and freeze, but we need to step, step out in courage. Let me give you a few of these. I believe God wants us all to stand out in Scripture. As Christians, we need courage to take a stand for truth and Scripture. It is so easy and so apparent right now how many preachers, how many churches, how many Christians are ashamed of what this book says. And they say, you know what? This could offend people. This could hurt somebody's feelings. This doesn't fit uh, with what culture says is right and wrong anymore. Um, and, and so we're kind of ashamed of that. So let's not teach that. Let's erase that from the Bible. Or let's rationalize it away so we don't hurt people or call them to repentance and to look to Jesus as Savior. Let's just say everybody's good. And people are cowering in fear because the real fear behind that is we want our churches to grow. We want money to come in. We want to survive as a church. And if we keep preaching truth, that'll shoot people away rather than let's just compromise to bring people in. It's driven by fear. Isn't it? And we become ashamed of truth. I mean, I've felt this. I've felt this with certain people that I'm talking to. And they're like, wait, you really believe that? You really like all that stuff in the Bible? You know, and I feel that moment of kind of cowering. Of, I want them to like me. I want them to respect me. I don't want them to think I'm naive. And so I feel the pressure to cower. I'm like, well, you know, it was written a long time ago. But that's, this is the Word of God. God says we're to stand on. What, what did Paul say? Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek he says in 1 Corinthians 1, God shows what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. We don't need to make excuses for truth. We need to stand up for it. We don't need to... I mean, I mean how many, maybe it's not even to your shame of the Scripture. You're, you just want to be liked and accepted. And you know there's people in your life that God's calling you to go be a light to. That God's calling you uh, to reach out to and share the Gospel. But you're so afraid that they might be hurt, they might view you different, that you cower away or you say, God, just please present the right timing. But that's really just an excuse so you can sit back and never do it. Maybe God's saying, hey, it's time to get up out of the fear. Have faith that I'm sovereign and have faith that I'll work with you. Uh, invite them to the potluck. Right? Just say, hey, like, like, you know, I, I, I'm afraid of sharing the whole gospel here, but we have this thing where you have food after church. Everyone's a little weird, but it's okay. We come together. I, I hope you can make it. Right? I mean, worst they can say is no, and I hate you. And it's just, but, but God calls us to be lights. And so often we cower away out of fear. As Christians in America, especially these times, we need to take a stand for truth. Be unashamed of it. Be a light. Second way as Christians we need to be courageous like Jonathan was is we need to pursue deep relationships. What do I mean by that? I think social media has hurt us, but I think also the pandemic as we isolate ourselves. A lot of us have hundreds or thousands of friends, but they're an inch deep. And we get used to, I have these people that follow me, these people that like me, or I know them by name, uh, but I never really be vulnerable. I never really share the deep parts of my heart, and I never really open up or commit. I mean, we see this with people that play church. There's so many Christians now that they're playing the part of, you know what, I visit this church on this week because that pastor, he only goes 30 minutes instead of 40. And then this one, I like the worship over here. They have better donuts. You know, and literally, they will rotate around or listen to this person online. But what they're really doing is avoiding because churches work. Because you've got to commit. You've got to get to know people. You've got to go deep, right? The Bible says we're to bear each other's burdens. We're to be vulnerable. We're to confess one to another our sins and our struggles. That's hard. Relationships are hard. Being vulnerable is hard. It's easier to stay home, I know. There's times where, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard to go talk to people and, and tell them what's going on. It's much easier to be isolated. And so many Christians do this. And God says, no, you're called to step out of the fear, to be vulnerable, to be real, to be accountable, to grow together. That's how I've designed you to be in community. But so many people avoid that. And I, I understand why. I mean, so many people... Maybe, maybe you found one church you like, but, but you don't go frequent enough for anybody to know you. I know I'm stepping on toes here, and I'm not meaning to do that, but I'm just saying what the book says. Hebrews 10 says, do not forsake the assembly of believers. Do not forsake. Don't not go to church. 
But if we come once a month, or we come once every three weeks, what it does is we can say hi and just have a little bit of small talk, but we don't really, people, it doesn't give them an opportunity to know us. And what kind of an example is that, even to your kids or your coworkers? If you're sharing to be a light with your coworkers, but they're like, well, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, well, you know what, we went out surfing again, or we went to brunch again, and this, and I'm like, well, wait, I thought you said that everything that matters is Jesus and worshiping Him, and you only go like once a month? What kind of example is that we need to be courageous, step out, pursue deep relationships? Another way, we need to be courageous to be generous. It's a hard one. It's money. I don't like talking about money from the pulpit. People are like, oh, he just wants money. It's instantly where everybody goes. But here's the thing. The early church, Christianity spread like wildfire. You know why? Because it says in the book of Acts that people were radically generous. Money talks, doesn't it? You've experienced somebody that was generous to you before. You can't replace that feeling. And the church, the early church, they all of a sudden, instead of living in the fear of my money is my safety, my bank account is my safety, and that's what I hold on to and I cling to, they said, no, you know what, God? You are our safety. You are our provider. You are our sustainer. It doesn't matter. This, this money's good, and I'm going to work for it, and I'm going to save some, but I'm going to give because I know if I give, you'll bless me, and you can bless those around you because you are the ultimate provider. And it changed the world. It changed the face of the planet because people experienced love and generosity. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Luke 6, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and will be put on your lap for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Are you so fearful of you need security, you need safety, that you hold on to your money so tight that you can't be generous and a light to those around you. A couple more. Do you have courage to change? There's such a culture in Christianity right now, and I'm guilty of it too at times, where the way we talk is like, well, we're all sinners, we're all losers, but Jesus saves us, so that's good news. But this is, you know, we all struggle with sin. I struggle with sin. You struggle with sin. So let's just live struggling with sin. We'll never have any victory, but it's okay. The cross covers us. Fist bump. It's literally, you hear preachers talk like that. You see, but the real gospel, what does it say? That he's called us out of darkness into marvelous light. That he's called us to change. That he's called us to victory. The, the, the gospel is Jesus says, I'm saving you from sin. Not just the consequences of sin, but I'm saving you from living in the bondage of sin. And how are people to come to know Jesus if they look at us and we're no different than them? They, they need to look at us and see, wow, you're different. You're forgiving. You're loving. You're generous. You have joy when you shouldn't have joy. You keep going when you shouldn't be. Keep going. And we can say, it's because Jesus has saved me. When they see that, change will happen. We need to remember that. I love 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a God of victory. Last one. We need courage to keep going amidst discouragement. How many of you are discouraged this morning? You feel burnt out. I meet a lot of people in the community. There's a lot of people like, you know what? I went to church for like 20 years, this one church years ago, but it's been years since I've been back. And I'm like, well, what, what happened? They're like, well, I got burned. Those people, they lied to me, they took advantage of me, they hurt my feelings, I opened up in a Bible study and they judged me, uh, and, and now they've isolated and secluded themselves and just lived in the misery of discouragement. But God says, no, don't live in that. Do, do, do you have the courage to step out of the fear and change and keep growing? I, I know it takes courage. I mean, it, it's a scary thing to try to change and stay the course, isn't it? Because what if you try, you try to change, you try to grow, um, but you fail, and then you're like, well, I wasted my time, or now I feel even worse because I got my hopes up, and now I failed again. God says, no, take courage. With all that said, with all that said, we're almost done, but 1 Samuel 14, 11, let's look at what happens. Jonathan and his armor bearer, they take courage, they climb up the hill, and it says this in 11, so both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they've hidden themselves. And the, mayor of the, Guinness, the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. So they crawl up halfway the hill, they show themselves, and the Philistines look down, they start laughing. They're like, oh yeah, you're the Hebrews that are hiding in fear. Oh yeah, why don't you come up and, and we'll show you how battle's done. We'll teach you a little lesson. Right? In other words, come up, we're going to kill you. Good luck if you think you're going to fight us with two guys. Then look at what happens next. Verse 12. 
garrison hailed Jonathan as armor bearer and said, Come up to us, we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and his feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a furrow's length and an acre of land. There was panic in the camp and the field and among all the people in the garrison. And even the raiders trembled and the earth quaked and it became a great panic. What happened? Jonathan, his armor bearer, they see him. They climb up. They have faith. They step out in faith. They kill 20 guys. It causes such a panic in the camp that God's, God causes the earth to tremble and the Philistines are defeated that day. If you go down to verse 23, it says, So the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle passed beyond beth Here's the key of this story. God brought victory. God was the one that did that. Two guys can't defeat a thousand. It's impossible. God was the one that was victorious. But you know what? Before God brought the victory, what happened? Two guys stepped out in faith. And I think as Christians, we need to remember that our God is a God of victory. He's a God of change. He's a God of power. He's a God that He can do anything. And I think so. we look at these times that we're in in our nation, we're like, oh, there's nothing that's going to turn this thing around. It's over. Uh, you know, and we just live and cower in fear and just wait for something bad to happen. Instead, when God's like, no, I'm calling you to step out in faith and so I can use you to bring about victory and change. But we forget that. And I think as Christians today, are you living in fear? And God is saying, hey, it's time to step up, to stand up and have faith in me and trust in me and let me work and have victory in your life. How many of you, there's something in your life where you're like, God, I can't beat this. I can't fix this. I don't know what to do. It, it's, nothing's going to change. And God's saying, do you have faith in me to step out and be vulnerable and try and engage community, go to the Bible studies, have people around you in your corner and fight the good fight of faith and let me have victory in your life. How many of you, God's saying, hey, I want to use your life to be a light in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your family, with your significant other, and I can have victory. As Christians, we need to stand up. So we close. I'm going to read Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's an interesting verse saying, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of everything going around you. Don't be afraid of losing your job. Don't be afraid of losing someone. Don't be all the fears. That, you shouldn't be worried about that. What you really should be worried about, do you know Jesus? Because hell's a real place. And when you die, if you don't know Christ, that's where you're headed. But the good news is Jesus came, He died, He rose again. You can believe in Him and be saved. This morning, are you right with Christ? Is your faith in Him? Are you stepping out in faith? Do you know Him? Have you accepted the free gift of salvation so you never have to fear death? You never have to fear hell because your security, your salvation is secure. Let me pray. Father, I'm so thankful that uh, You call us out of darkness into light. That You call us out of fear into faith. And when we have faith and walk in You, victory is assured. And I pray for my friends here this morning, especially those who don't know You, Jesus, or haven't been walking with You, that maybe this morning they say, Jesus, I've been fearing all the wrong things. I've been focused on all the wrong things, looking to the wrong places. I need to look to You. I need to get my life right with You. I believe You died and rose again. I want to repent of my sins. Save me and change me. And I pray for the rest of us, Lord, that we, have all, we all have different fears. That we'd replace our fear with faith that we'd look to Your truth to hold us in moments when we lack faith, and that we would step out in faith. Lord, would we be bold? Would we walk in righteousness? Would we stand on the Word of God? Would we stand on truth? Would fear have no longer a hold on us, but only the joy of knowing You? In Your name we pray. Amen.